I'm starting a film photography project where I limit myself to one camera, one lens, and one film type for one year. The idea is to eliminate distractions so I can focus on the creative side of shooting with film. Now I already splurged on a camera and picked up a Leica MP in glorious black paint finish. You can check out my unboxing and first impressions video up here in the corner, but spoiler alert, it's freaking amazing. I love it. But we still need to talk about lens and film choice for the next year, so let's start with that lens. Let's be honest here, the Leica 35mm Summicron would be my dream lens for this camera, but I just spent all my money on the MP and the budget monster reared its ugly head and hit me with a level 5 guilt trip. It wouldn't hurt to save a wee bit of money with this lens. So I checked out a couple lenses from Zeiss and Voigtlander to see what's what, and there's some good choices out there. The Voigtlander 35mm f2 Ultron is getting tons of buzz for its compact size and solid image quality. It's the kind of lens that has modern sharpness with a more vintage feel in the out of focus areas. Tons of character and definitely interesting, but the lens's minimum focus distance is 0.58 meters, which is less than the 0.7 meters minimum of the Leica MP's rangefinder. This means there's no real way to verify close focus distance when you're looking through the viewfinder, and that would drive me crazy, so I crossed the Ultron off my list. Voigtlander also makes the tiny little 35mm f2.5 color scope bar, which is super well respected, especially for the price, but this lens was a little too small and fiddly for me, so I took a pass on that as well. Then I looked at the Zeiss C Biagon 35mm f2.8. In fact, I borrowed this one from a friend. It's sharp as attack with enough image character and 3D pop to stand up to the big boys, but it's only an f2.8 lens, and I'm going to be shooting a lot indoors over the winter, so that extra stop makes a difference. And I know Zeiss also makes a 35mm f2, but I've never really connected with that lens. I don't know if it's the size or the way that it balances on the camera, but it's just not for me. The truth is any of these lenses would have worked, but I couldn't stop thinking about the Summicron. There's no doubt this is an iconic piece of glass, but it's nearly four times the price of the Zeiss or Voigtlander lenses. How could I possibly justify spending that much money on a lens? Oh, like this. You see, I know me. And if I bought the Ultron or the Zeiss or whatever lens I was looking at, I'd be thinking about the Summicron the whole time. Is this as good as the Cron? What if I shot this picture on the Cron? Why didn't I just get the Cron? Cron, Cron, Cron. I wouldn't be able to let it go and eventually I'd end up selling the cheaper lens, probably for half of what I paid for it, just to buy the damn Summicron anyway. Now I'd be spending the cost of the Summicron plus the money I lost buying and selling the cheaper lens. So if you think about it, I'd actually be saving money by buying the more expensive lens in the first place. So I cut out the middleman and bought a brand new 35 Cron A Spherical version 2. And here it is in its beautiful silver box. Let's go to that overhead cam. It's a heck of a lens. It's compact and well balanced on the Leica MP body. And of course it has that legendary Leica build quality that makes my downstairs dingle every time I use it. Mm, dingling. The aperture clicks confidently into place in half stop increments and it has a proper focus tab. This can be used for adjusting focus but also as a physical reminder of your focus distance. This comes in super handy for us zone focus people. This is version 2 of the 35mm Summicron Spherical that Leica released in 2016. As near as I can tell this is the same optical formula as version 1 but they added one extra aperture blade for better bokeh if that's your dealio. They also swapped out the plastic hood for a metal version that's ventilated so you can see through it when you're looking through the optical viewfinder. Those are both nice additions but the important thing for me is that this lens has the same classic Summicron rendering as the previous version. And I know there's lots of people out there who are going to say that Cron images look boring and I'm not going to take a side in that battle even though you're clearly wrong. But when you consider size, weight, and price, the Cron made a lot of sense for me, especially when shooting on the street. So there it is. And there it's going to stay. For the next year anyways. Now let's talk about my film choice. I'm going to shoot black and white for this year-long project so I can develop and scan everything myself at home. Partly to save money, but mostly for the control it will give me to fine-tune processing and get everything looking exactly the way I like. Now there are lots of film choices, but for me it came down to HP5 Plus or Triax, and I decided to go with HP5 this time around. Right off the bat, it's way cheaper than Triax. At the time of making this video, a 100-foot roll of HP5 Plus is $109.99 at B&H. Now you have to roll your own film cartridges, but you should get about 18 rolls of 36 exposures out of that 100-foot roll. That's like six bucks a roll. The same amount of Triax costs a whopping $149.95. That's 36% more. That's a lot of clams. So cost is a big factor, but I also just 
just like the way HP5 looks. Grain is there, but it's not overwhelming. It's got a bit more shadow detail than Trix, and the long silvery midtones are a feast for the eyes. The film definitely has its own character, but it doesn't clobber you over the head with an over-the-top look. I'm talking to you, Agfa. Throw in the fact that HP5 can be pushed two or even three stops with excellent results, and you've got a film that will last me to the end of this project, no sweat. And here it is. And it's in a box. You know what that means. To the overhead cam. <laughs>